Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship. We continue to celebrate the blessings of Christ's resurrection. And today we focus on this amazing, gracious love that God has for us, and that love that we can reflect to one another. We're going to have some special music this morning. We have a group called Chapel Singers. We work on special songs on our Wednesday chapel, and we wanted to share some of those with you here today as well. So we're opening hymn. You can follow along in uh, hymn 615, Jesus Thank You, in the hymnal. But notice that the song leaders will sing verse 1, the congregation will join in verse 2, and our students are going to sing verse 3 in Spanish as we join in the refrain. Please rise.
We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Dear friends, let us approach God of the true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated as we sing Glory to God in the Highest. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the giver of everything good. Inspire us, your humble servants, to long for what is right, and through your gracious guidance, accomplish it to your glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first lesson is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 9. The apostles are sharing the good news and the power of Jesus' resurrection, and using that power, Peter is able to raise Tabitha from the dead. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room, then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. 
She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. The word of our Lord. Today we sing a song version of Psalm 89 as printed. Our epistle lesson is taken from John's first epistle, chapter 4. These words, again, on the agape love that God has for us that we want to share with others. This will be the basis for the sermon this morning. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister as a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The word of the Lord. Be Please rise. Our gospel acclamation is taken from the great resurrection chapter or the great chapter on love, 1 Corinthians 13. Alleluia, alleluia. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Alleluia. A gospel reading, we hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 15. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We're singing our hymn of the day, This is My Father's Will. And during verse 3, the children can come sit on the carpet squares for our children's message. morning. Grab a carpet square and find a spot to sit here. All right. Some more friends are joining us. Got plenty of squares here. All right. Today I want to talk about the word love. You guys probably hear that word quite a bit, don't you? Maybe you hear it from your mommy and daddies. I hope every day, right? I love you. Maybe right before you go to bed, you say, I love you, mommy, or I love you, daddy, and they say, we love you. You probably hear that word love quite a bit. Do you ever think about what that word means? Anybody want to try and tell me what that word means? Jesus. Okay. <laughs> that, that's a great answer. In fact, that's really... That's the, what I'm going to talk about in the sermon. God is love. So that's an A-plus answer. Um, but how would you, if someone said, what does love mean, how would you try to explain it to them? Someone loves them? Yeah. What does it mean to love someone? Does it mean to like them? Yeah, you like them. It means maybe you want to be around them. Maybe they do nice things for you, and so you want to do nice things for them. That's how we usually think of love. Another way we might say love is, what's, uh, who, wants, who wants to tell me their favorite food? What's your favorite food? Yeah. Macaroni and cheese. Yeah. We might say we love macaroni and cheese, right? What's your favorite food? Yeah, okay. Chicken. All right. Chicken. One more. Spaghetti, okay. You might say you love chicken, you love spaghetti, you love macaroni and cheese, but when you say you love your mommy or daddy, that's a different type of love, isn't it? And when we say that God loves us, that's a different type of love too. 
It's interesting, that word love, it can mean a lot of different things, right? But God's love is a special kind of love. Can you guys say this word? It's a, it's a new word it's called agape. Can you say that? Agape. Agape. And that means, that's the special word in the Bible for God's love for us. And that is a type of love that we see when Jesus died for us on the cross. Agape love is, it sacrifices itself, right? Gives itself up. It loves people even if they don't love them back. It's so loving that it loves people even that, even that are angry or mean to them. That's what Jesus showed us, right? When he died on the cross, he loved us even when we didn't love him back. That's a special type of God's love, right? So I want to teach you a special, a little rhyme to help you remember this, right? So you spell agape, A-G-A-P-E. Can you say that? A-G-A-P-E. Get your hands up to clap. A-G-A-P-E. Very good. So we're going to say, how does God love me? A-G-A-P-E. Can we try that? All right. Get your clappers ready. How does God love me? A-G-A-P-E. How does God love me? A-G-A-P-E. You guys are getting pretty good. All right. Let's do it really soft this time. How does God love me? A-G-A-P-E. Now can we do it really loud? How does God love me? A-G-A-P-E. All right. Very good. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your special kind of love, the agape love that you showed to us. Thank you for loving us and showing us what real love is when you died for us on the cross, when you promised to be with us forever and take us to heaven. Let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up today. We'll sing our final verses. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Savior who has so loved us, Jesus Christ. Our sermon is based on 1 John chapter 4. I'm really going to focus on chap uh, verses 4 through 11. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, only you can show us what true love is. Thank you for the love that we share together as your people and for the love that you give to us in your word. Amen. Taylor Swift's latest album surpassed 1 million, excuse me, 1 billion Spotify streams in a single week. She became the first artist to hold the top 14 spots on the Billboard's top 100 hits. Her music is listened to by millions of people every second. She was Spotify's most popular artist. Um, listened to in 2023, and she's on her way, well on her way in 2024 to reclaim that title. Needless to say, with her new album and with the however many in the past, her music and, and her, her lyrics have shaped the way a lot of people think, a lot, of way, a lot of the ways that young people consider the world and think about what's hip or what's cool and what's not. I want you to take a, a look at some of the lyrics from that new album with me. This is from her song called Daddy, I Love Him. She says, I just learned these people only raise you to cage you. Hannah's and Sarah's in their Sunday best, clutching, at, clutching their pearls, sighing, what a mess. Sorry to all the Hannah's and Sarah's out here today. Uh, she says, I just learned these people try to save you. 
because they hate you. I'll tell you something right now. You ain't got to pray for me, uh, me and my wild boy and all of this wild joy. It's my choice, screaming, but daddy, I love him. I could talk about some of the sort of shots at Christianity taken here, but ultimately, if you look at the message, it's really about her love being most important. Ultimately, you can't, you can't speak against love, right? You can't argue with love. Right? If she loves him, then anything you do to try and turn her off that path is wrong and, and bigoted and narrow-minded. Love is what's most important. Here's, a, here's some more from a different song called Guilty as Sin, which is a bit provocative. What if I roll the stone away? They're going to crucify me anyway. What if the way you hold me is actually what's holy? If long-suffering propriety, that's like conformance to a, a standard, is what they want from me, they don't know how you've haunted me so stunningly. I choose you and me religiously. Again, the, the Christian overtones kind of catch our attention, don't they? But she uses it to really kind of pull in a reverse truth. She says, she brings up kind of Christian truths, but then she says, what's really holy is my, my relationship with this man. What's really worthy of worship is, is my love. That's, that's kind of, this, if I could sum up the message of these songs in general, it'd be that love is God. Love is God. That's the refrain that's really pumped into our ears from almost every uh, popular song these days, isn't it? Love can't be wrong. Love is what we must listen to above all else. You can't argue because love is God. It's not just the refrain of pop songs, it's the refrain of our society. And now my point today is not to say that you can't be a Christian and listen to Taylor Swift. I could have probably made the point from almost any popular artist. She's just by far the most popular right now. My point is that I think we've grown numb to how often we hear this message, love is God. And I think that we forget how dangerous this message is, and to an extent, how much we've probably swallowed it. How much it affects our life, how we choose to act, how we think about God and his word, and yes, how we worship our Lord. That's why we come to God's house, isn't it? We come here to, to realign ourselves with what is, is true. We come here to hear about who God really is from his own mouth, we come here to hear about what love really is. And we come here today and we look in the scriptures and we find that while love is not God, God is love. That's what the Apostle John talks about in his first epistle in chapter 4. He writes this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Love cannot be God because love comes from God. It is God who establishes and defines love, not the other way around. And that means that the love which is spoken of here is very specific. It is that word in Greek, agape, that special love of God, that sacrificial love, that active love of God, that selfless love of God that can only come from God. This is not a human kind of love. This is not a, a feeling of affection. This is something that is unearthly. It has its origin in God himself. And it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit that, by faith, has been planted into your heart. Think about that. Through faith, you have the capacity to love in an uncommon way. God has given you, by the Holy Spirit, the ability to love as he has loved. If we think that love is God, we're going to lose that special privilege and, and priority of loving people in a sacrificial and selfless way. We lose the, the understanding of what love really means. Next, John says this. He says, everyone who, has, who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, this is the verse that often gets misunderstood because usually it gets kind of taken out of context. John is not saying that anybody who's ever loved someone knows what God's really about. Anybody who has this sort of 
strong feeling of affection is somehow connected to the divine. That's, that's not what he's saying. When he talks about being born of God or knowing God, these are, are words talking about having faith in Christ. We could say, John would say, everyone who loves has faith in Jesus. And whoever does not love does, does not know Jesus. This agape love is demonstrated by those who have been changed inwardly by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in a very real sense, this love is an indispensable sign of having faith in Jesus Christ. John draws a sharp line. He says, not only those who, who don't know Jesus cannot love like this, but he says those who know Jesus love like this. It's who they are. They are going to love like their heavenly Father will love. John says, everyone who loves has true faith in God. Whoever does not love has no faith in God. And that brings us to his famous words, because God is love. God is love. What does this mean? A good Lutheran question, right? What does it mean that God is love? Now, it, it means that God in his very nature is loving. Love is not merely something that God shows us. Love is part of who God is. It is an essential attribute of our God. And so any view of God that neglects love distorts who he is. Anybody who thinks of God as mean and spiteful and, and, and angry and, and horrid, that's not the God of the Bible. Any view of God that sees him as distant and far away and unconcerned, that's not the God revealed in Scripture because God is love. No action of God, no word spoken by God, nothing about God can be divorced from love because our God is love. But that's not usually the issue I come across most often. It's not usually that people don't think God is loving. It's that usually people think that God is only loving. And that this love is really theirs to define. It's after a service in Madison that um, all the congregation had, had gone out of the church. And after there was, there was one woman uh, waiting there for me, she wanted to talk. She was from a, a social organization, and she wanted to ask about our church's stance on some sort of hot topics at the time. So we went to my office, and we sat down. We had a pretty good conversation, about a half hour. But toward the end, I, I, I started showing her some, some Bible passages that, that you know, showed why, we, why our stance is what it was. And the conversation sort of started to break down. And then she... She brought up this verse from 1 John chapter 4. She said, well, I don't know about that verse, she said, because isn't the message of the Bible really all about love? God is love. How often don't we hear a sentiment like that? Or an idea pushed on this sort of foundation, right? That we should really kind of just paint with a broad brush. Well, you know, after all, God is love. All those details all those words of Scripture, they're all subordinate to that. Because God is love, and I can define love. It really substitutes an equal sign. It says God equals love, and if it's a math equation, right, you could switch those around. God is love, and love is God. And you're back to the, the refrain of our society. Love is something that people would like to define on their own terms. And if God is love and God equals love, then, well, they can define God however they want as well. Do you see how insidious, how, how sneaky this is? And how, how much it, it affects people? My friends, when this purposefully generalizes God's law, it does it in order to transgress God's law. It's like it hollows out the commands of God until they weigh less than human desire and human approval. It sort of smushes down the Bible into a small stone so they can step over it. I think that this is one of the, this is why this refrain is, is so dangerous today. The Apostle Paul in Romans, he says that they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for a lie. And they worshipped created things rather than the Creator. 
Isn't that what has happened with the idea of earthly love? We've exchanged the agape, holy, righteous, perfect love of God for a human idea of what love should be. And any time we exchange the glory of the true God with a lesser concept, whether that's one made out of wood and stone or one constructed by our own thinking or by our society, we are practicing idolatry. And taking our God of, of perfect love and then stripping him of his attributes of holiness and of justice and authority and taking away his word and then holding him up is to make of him just as much an idol as a crude statue of stone. I think part of the reason that we often have a, a hole in the bucket of our personal holiness is because we have swallowed this lie to an extent. We think often to ourselves that God's love overshadows his perfect holiness. We think to ourselves, I should get more serious about rooting out this sin in my life. I should be in the word more. But God is loving. I know that he forgives me. I should work on giving more sacrificially. I should seek to be more honest. But I know that God forgives me. God is love. The best lies contain a lot of truth, don't they? Does God love us? Yes, with an everlasting love. Does God forgive us when we repent? Yes, of course. But the idea that God's love makes him in some ways lenient or lazy about judgment over sin doesn't make any sense. The idea that since our God is loving, we shouldn't seek to love him and love others as urgently doesn't make any sense. Ironically, when we misunderstand God and his love, we become worse at loving each other. If we don't understand God's love for us, we're not going to be loving in a sacrificial way to one another. We have no basis for it. We're not going to love people with eternity in mind. We'll love them in just a way that gives them a nice life here. It makes them feel comfortable. We're not going to love people in an uncommon way that's good for their soul. We'll love them in a common and earthly way. My friends, God is love. And that perfect, selfless love includes and works in harmony with all of his perfect commands, his perfect justice, and all of his other attributes. When we say that God is love, we don't mean that he is more loving than he is condemning or that he's more loving than he is just. That's a false conflict. God's love and God's judgment support each other, even depend upon one another. Think about this. Imagine a man commits a murder and he goes into court and the judge says, you know what? I'm a loving judge. You're free to go. If you were in the jury, would you feel like that was the loving thing to do? Would that be loving to the person who lost their life? To the family who now mourns a, a lost one? Would that be loving to the community who now is in fear because there's no punishment for those who commit wrong? Would it even be loving for the man who committed the murder who now goes and is emboldened in his sin? It's obvious if, if, if the judge is loving, he should be just. And the same thing is true with God. Right? If God is loving, he must be a just God who, who hates sin and wants to end all suffering. If God is just, he must stand by his commands. What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Remain in my love, he says. God is love and God is holy. There's nothing uh, wrong with those two things standing side by side and supporting each other. God is love and God is light and God is truth and God is life. God is all these things perfectly and fully and for you. Maturity in faith grows when we appreciate how the attributes of God work in harmony with one another not against one another. The more you understand about God's love, the more you're going to understand how just he is. And the more you understand about how holy God is, how, how set apart he is from humanity, how, how much he hates sin, the better you understand God's love, which caused him to come here to earth 
and to become sin in our place and to die for us. That's what John goes on to explain, the, the incredible love of God. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We're so used to hearing these words that we forget how absurd it is. How crazy this love of God truly is. What father sacrifices his son? Fathers here today, can you comprehend that kind of love? And not just for good people who mean well, but for people who were by nature enemies of God. What kind of love is this? What immortal God who is infinitely more valuable and infinitely more worthy than we are would come and, and die for sinful human ants. If, if you go today and, and there's an ant crossing the road and you don't dive in front of a car to save that ant, no one's going to think you're loving. They're going to they're gonna think you need help, right? They're going to they're gonna say, maybe we, should, maybe we should get you some help, you know? Um, that's not a loving thing to do. You're crazy. That's an ant. But the distance and the difference qualitatively between an ant and a human is nothing compared to the difference between the Almighty God and a human speck of dust. And yet God was willing to send his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love. Who could have guessed? Only God could love like this. It is beyond our comprehension. And only by the Holy Spirit's power through the word can we grasp just a little bit how wide and how high and how long and how deep is the love of Christ. A friend, only God can define love like this and only God would demonstrate love like this and only God can empower you to love like he loves. How does God love me? A-G-A-P-E. Verse 11, dear friends, since God has so loved us, we also ought to love to agape one another. It's a good reminder that Christian faith is not about trying out a new set of habits. It's not about working on a few things and, you know, becoming a little bit better person. It's not about nice people getting a bit nicer or mean-spirited people mellowing out a bit. It's about a divine miracle. It's about the implantation of a new heart that beats with God's love. It's about something that is from God, that is above, that is now within you. Do you see the, the beauty here that, that you have the ability to love in an uncommon, unearthly way because of your Savior Jesus? You can love people like God has so loved you. And just as surely as the child's DNA can be traced back to their parents, so God's love has been written into your baptismal DNA. Don't worry so much about what this world thinks is normal or, or prudent when it comes to love. Don't worry so much about even that your love would be received as love. Jesus' love was all often misunderstood and not appreciated for what it was. No, be willing to be uncommon. Love your family sacrificially. Love your church in an uncommon way. John says we ought to love, right? It, in other words, it is good and it is right for us to practice this love among each other in, in the Christian body of Christ that that our church might be a, a beautiful picture of God's love in action to one another and to the community. Sacrificial agape love is just what we do in this family. It's just who we are. John says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God because God is love. Amen. Please stand.
The peace of God which surpasses all our understanding may guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the prayer of the church. Risen Savior, you command and empower us to love as you have loved us. Mold our hearts to love one another intentionally. May our church be an example of Christ-like love in our community. Hold your cross before our eyes as we forgive and serve one another. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. Take away our love of sinning and restore us each day by your grace. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Give us courage to bear your name with boldness and conviction. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal, between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Protect our children and give them joy. Lord, you let us pray. Blessed Lord, you've given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Once again, it's one of our songs that we've been singing in chapel. It reminds us that in Christ, we are more than conquerors. Sing along as printed as you feel comfortable.
Greetings to all of you. We're glad that you could share this special service with us. Thank you to all of our musicians, our chapel choir for beautifying us, for our bell choir. It was very beautiful.